There you are. You've got to be a little careful around these two. One wrong move, and suddenly you're on their bad side. Hermes and Apollo here are just two of the ancient deities that the Museum of Antiquities features in our spectacular collection of replica statues and original artifacts from across the ancient Greek world. Much of what we celebrate about ancient Greece is based around a bright and vibrant culture of art, architecture, and storytelling. But not everything in ancient Greece was sunshine and rainbows, as tragedy and horror can be found throughout their myths, artwork, and history. Monsters. Curses. The Underworld. Greek myth is full of such scares, many of which remain cultural icons to this day. And so tonight, for our final episode of A Haunted Night at the Museum, I'll be showing you some of the gods in our collection. The mythical figures that these statues represented were mighty beings of divine nature, who the ancients feared as well as respected. The gods gave a human face to the natural and often unexplainable phenomena of the world the ancient Greeks lived in, and each had a personality as distinctive as any real person. The godly members of the Greek pantheon each held sway over the lives of mortals in a unique and sometimes perilous fashion, each with their own specific sphere of influence. While the gods were worshipped for traits that humans celebrated, like Apollo's role as the sun god, Aphrodite's dominion over love, and Athena's ability to bring about victory in a war for a just cause, the gods also had a dark side that could bring woe and disaster to human beings especially to those who wronged or did not respect the gods. Today, we will be exploring the dark side of the famed Greek gods. The first god we will be looking at tonight is the sun god Apollo, who is depicted here by a replica statue of an original artifact known as the Apollo Lycaeus, a piece dated to 360 BCE that now resides in the Stadtlich Museum Superlen. This statue shows Apollo with his prized instrument, the lyre. Apollo was the god of the sun, music, poetry, and other traits that made him one of the most popular gods across the Mediterranean. He was a god of dualistic temperaments, however, as the ancient myths portray him as dangerous as he was helpful. Though he could perform great feats of heroics, like defeating the dragon Python with his silver bow at Delphi, he was also known to turn his weapons against mortals who paid him insult, as he did against Niobe when he and his sister Artemis murdered the queen's fourteen children. Because of myths such as this, he was generally accepted to be responsible for the death of young men. Such was Apollo's power that Greeks believed prayers and sacrifices could be offered to him in exchange for healing. And yet his ability as a god of healing is paralleled by his capacity to spread death and disease, as he did to the invading Greek army besieging Troy in Homer's ancient epic, the Iliad. One passage from the poem shows us just how terrifying Apollo's wrath was. He came down furious from the summits of Olympus, with his bow and his quiver upon his shoulder, and the arrows rattled on his back with the rage that trembled within him. He sat himself down away from the ships with a face as dark as night, and his silver bow rang death as he shot his arrow in the midst of them. First, he smote their mules and their hounds, but presently he aimed his shafts at the people themselves, and all day long the pyres of the dead were burning. With such a capacity for death and vengeance, Apollo becomes a foreboding and formidable figure, far from the light and airy god of music that one might guess him to be from his leer. Indeed, even gods associated with positive ideas like love and beauty could bring doom to mortals on an individual and even on a societal scale. Holding a mirror in one hand and an orb in the other, this statue depicts the love goddess Aphrodite. This piece is known as the Aphrodite of Arles, and is a replica of an original marble statue that now resides in the Louvre and was produced sometime in the 4th century BCE and recovered in 1651 from the Roman theater of Arles, France. The orb in her right hand is the golden apple of discord, the piece of fruit that the goddess Discord inscribed with the message to the most beautiful. When Discord dropped the apple into the middle of a wedding attended by Aphrodite, Hera, and Athena, the three goddesses started to feud over who was the most deserving of the apple, and therefore the title, the most beautiful. The Trojan prince Paris was chosen by Zeus to be the judge of who would receive the apple. When Aphrodite told Paris she would help him marry Helen of Troy, the greatest mortal beauty in the world, the prince accepted and gave the apple to her. The fallout from Aphrodite's intervention is disastrous, as Paris and Helen flee to Troy and set into motion the fabled Trojan War. It is here that the danger of Aphrodite's power can be seen, as Aphrodite's dominion over love and desire shattered the Greek and Trojan alliance, 
leading to an epic 10-year-long war that results in destruction and tragedy on a grand scale. In this case, Aphrodite is not the source of mature love or faithful marriage, but instead she sows division between a husband and wife, and ultimately sets Paris and Helen up for a romance with a tragic end. Knowing Aphrodite's role in myths such as this helps us to understand that the ancients understood love and desire to be something that everyone wanted, but they were also emotions that could lead to self-destruction and even societal conflict. Greek gods were both creative and destructive forces, elemental beings capable of good and evil on a grand scale. Even wise Athena, who was a goddess tied with intelligence, craft, and civilization, was linked with the destructive forces of war. Athena is depicted in the panel behind me, a replica of an original marble relief produced in Athens sometime around the year 460 BCE. You can still find the original today in Athens, at the famous Acropolis Museum. While her iconic spear and helm show her status as a heroic warrior goddess and protector of the Athenians, she too had a darker side when crossed. Her vengeful nature is best shown by her role in the creation of Medusa, the terrifying Gorgon defeated by the legendary hero, Perseus. Medusa was a beautiful young maiden who served as a priestess of Athena in her temple in Athens. When Athena unfairly accused Medusa of having defiled her temple, the goddess turned Medusa into a horrifying creature with serpents instead of hair and a gaze that would transform any who met it into solid stone. Athena's wrathful nature is further shown when she later aids the hero Perseus in his quest to defeat Medusa, as she gifts him with the magical aegis, the mirror shield that the hero uses to avoid looking directly at Medusa's deathly gaze. As if to add insult to injury, Athena accepted Medusa's disembodied head from Perseus as a gift. In another disturbing twist of the myth, Athena enjoyed the sound of Medusa's Gorgon sisters mourning her death so much that the goddess created a flute mimicking the sound. The beheaded Medusa became one of Athena's principal icons, often appearing upon her shield as a terrifying fanged visage. Gorgon images such as this one from the Temple of Artemis in Corfu were commonly used as apotropaic devices, which simply means that this was an image considered so terrifying that it could be used to ward off evil spirits and ill omens. Knowing what Athena did to poor Medusa helps us to understand that even the good gods could be cruel, bringing death and destruction to those unlucky enough to anger them. Some of the Olympian gods are not quite as liberal with their divine punishment as Athena, and yet gods like Hermes had their own connections with death. Last week, we learned about the Egyptian afterlife and some of the ways that those people prepared for the next world upon death. The Greeks had their own ideas about death and what came after, and one deity closely tied to the afterlife is featured here in the Museum of Antiquities. This statue at my side is known as the Hermes with the infant Dionysus, and is a replica of an original marble done by the famed artist Praxiteles sometime in the 4th century BCE and rediscovered at Olympia in Greece in 1877. It is now displayed at the Archaeological Museum at Olympia. Hermes is shown cradling his baby brother Dionysus, the god of wine, an image that makes Hermes seem to be a kindly and nurturing figure. Hermes is a deity that demonstrates the dualistic nature of the Greek gods, how darkness and light can be found in equal measure within each divine figure. Seen as a trickster god, Hermes is known for his humor and proclivity for pranks. Phallic statues such as the one shown on screen were known as Herms, which were fertility symbols inspired by Hermes, and were used to mark boundaries. Ancient Greeks placed these Herms at entrances to buildings or the outskirts of cities to ward off evil, a role that emphasizes his power over borders and boundaries. Hermes was a messenger god, outfitted with a winged hat and sandals that enabled him to move at great speeds and across the barriers that separated the world of the living from the heavens, Mount Olympus, and from the underworld. Hermes had such an important role to play in crossing this boundary that he was known as Hermes Psychopompus, the only Greek deity consistently appearing on funerary monuments. The ancient Greeks saw Hermes as the guide who helped spirits of the deceased into the underworld, and even led the spirits of unmarried women down to wed Hades, the ruler of this dark and mysterious afterlife. Hermes was not alone in holding links to both life and death, as other major gods took on a dualistic relationship with humanity and the natural world. This piece here beside me is a replica of an artifact known as the Ludovici Throne, a religious altar dating back to the 5th century BCE, which you can now find at the Palazzo Altamp of the National Museum of Rome. Named for its chair-like shape when viewed from above, this was actually an element of a shrine. The image displayed upon the throne's front portion depicts another mythological scene that may represent the duality of yet another god. 
Scholars have argued several different cases for who the central figure of the Ludovici throne could be. Some have argued that this is Aphrodite being born, emerging from the sea foam in her full beauty. Others believe that this is Persephone, the divine daughter of the goddess of agriculture, Demeter. If this is indeed Persephone, then the scene that the throne depicts is likely that of Persephone's emergence from the underworld. Ancient legend has it that Hades, the infernal king of the underworld, fell in love with Persephone and stole her away to his shadowy realm. This enraged Persephone's mother, the mighty goddess Demeter, who in her wrath withdrew her blessing of life and warmth from the land of the living. For the mortal humans on earth, the immediate effect was the onset of an unceasing winter. Despite being a god relied upon by the humans for a good harvest, Demeter is shown to be brutal and uncaring, and only decides to return warmth and life to the world after Zeus ordered Hades to release Persephone, as the god king recognized the doom and destruction that were the result of Demeter's iron heartbreak. This image could thus serve to represent spring, renewal, and a rebirth from a place of darkness. For us in Saskatchewan, I think we can appreciate the idea that the Greeks were getting her cross by telling this myth. Sickness and healing, love and tragedy, life and death. Each of these ideas permeated the Greek world, and their mythology and art reflected this. Even gods representing the greatest pleasures in life, like love or music, could harbor dangers for the unsuspecting mortal. This tenuous relationship between humans and the gods can tell us a lot about the ancient Greek belief systems, but also about how they viewed aspects of human nature or the natural world. The Greek gods represented mighty forces and were deserving of respect. In paying homage to the physical representations of love, the harvest, even war, the Greeks hoped to enjoy the positive aspects of their gods' sphere of influence while avoiding the negative. Myths and legends helped these people understand not only the nature of the gods, but also the human experience itself. The gods and their stories help us to understand what the ancient Greek people valued in life, as well as what they feared. From the grim mysteries of death in the underworld, to the dangers of passionate love, the ancient Greeks had a myth and a god to describe all of life's tribulations. For more haunting legends and grim realities about the ancient world, make sure you check out the other episodes of this fantastic series which takes you from the tombs of ancient Egypt to the bonfires of Samhain. Thank you for watching, and remember, have a happy Halloween. Good night.